we've got a, a, a new book out called Rail Splitter, Reflections on the Art of Poetry Composed in the Posthumous Voice of Honest Abe Lincoln, Former Pres U.S. <clears throat> it's intended to be a bit excessive. <laughs> to a chigger. Oh, itchy beast of tiny figure. When I scratched myself, I made you bigger. Though you began as but a chigger, you redder rose, a pistol butt without a trigger. Thus we were foes. In armpit high or ankle lower, you left me last to be the knower, that you were first to be the goer, where sweat may trickle. And I was felled as by a mower with scythe and sickle. Though felled, hyperbolizes, true, the minor wounds I got from you, the itchiness I felt undo, a fierce attacking I never would have dreamed to woo from one so lacking. Yet me you often so infested I felt my life had been divested, <laughs> and bitterness I had ingested in the hotter days of youth when meaning is contested in lofty ways. But in age and temperament, I seasoned, and with your kind, I learned and reasoned. As an older dog contends with fleas and resolves the pest deserves its life, though it has treasoned and takes his rest. You are a bug of southern climes, yet strangely strode all through my times, symbolically, a bell whose chimes in turn are grating, refusing love to find that rhymes are dull negating. Um, this book is just out, and so I really don't have my shtick together for it. But uh, sometimes I, ha I have an old top hat that I got from the Lincoln birthplace over in Hodgenville. And I just forgot to bring it today. But imagine a big, tall stovepipe hat. Upside down. A brief refutation of the rumor that I allowed Willie and Tad to relieve themselves in my upturned hat on a Saturday morning at the office while their mother was attending religious services. <laughs> I will allow. A tall hat can be put to purposes other than the polite covering of the head. And the record shows I carried papers in mine, important papers too, and for dramatic effect I'd pull them out into court, bewildering my opponents. But that was practical. The documents intended to prove my claim were sheltered from the weather and less likely to be lost. And having words I'd taken care to write, proximate to the head from which they sprang, permitted me to ponder them, to keep them, so to speak, in the nest a little longer before they flew into the room to batter against the smudged windows of a prairie courthouse amid the clangs of a punctuating spittoon. It was a common place to fill my hat with oats and feed my horse when I was riding on the circuit. And the rooming houses where I lodged had few accommodations, so the hat was handy as a basin, as, as a basin where a morning ablution required. On this occasion, however, the hat was mere amusement for the boys who set it on the office floor and pitched pennies into it, stepping farther back each round as I was reading on the couch. Their mother was indeed at church. The weather was profoundly cold and the privy regrettably distant from the office. So <laughs> boys being boys with a famously permissive father, I agreed to let them use my boot.
the smell of open ground in spring. My brother's grave unmarked, my mother's too, and later my sister's, and finally my father's. All of them namelessly entered the ground. The human history, the sign that's known because it's missing, how innumerable existences have come and gone and gone to dust, and the eye of time refuses to blink. Someone digging a hole and singing and crying. Then someone loved is dropped in the ground and buried. No wonder believing in the afterlife and walking down a street of gold appeals. What is the point of being alive in the world? What is the point of watching your mother die? or the point of going to her bedside knowing the knowledge of death had set like the sun in her mind. And she whispered, be a good son. When metaphor and truth become the same, when the distance is erased between the fact and the figure representing it, one seeks blindly perhaps another metaphor. Behind a horse and a plow, I opened the ground in three states, sometimes reading a book as I went. Once, in the middle of Pilgrim's Progress, I realized the furrows in the field could just as well be verses on the page, and the point of being alive fell down on me, and the smell of open ground brought me to tears. While irony may wrap itself around a poem, the true poem, in the end, escapes the shroud. It's the art of resurrection. Some of you may know the little wildflower we have around here called henbit. It's a little, gets about that tall. Henbit. I know Gray Zeitz knows all about henbit. <clears throat> Not lilacs. I recall in spring flowers spreading over the pastures, common wildflowers too small to pick probably unnoticed most of the time, although abundant. Ashy purple leaves shading the little pink blossoms and thus dimming and dulling their hue. Sometimes the fields from a distance seemed soaked with blood, a wound for the country, always returning, real and symbolic, at once, like art, like all creation, like love, with liberty and irony for all. <laughs> this is uh, PG-13. <clears throat> uh, vulgarity and ode. This is based on a true story. Lincoln tried his hand as a, as a wrestler <laughs> as a young man. He, 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 some guy thought he would, he would, you know, make money getting Lincoln to wrestle <clears throat> because he was a big strapping fella. Vulgarity and ode. I told the biggest toughest boy from Clary's Grove, if you don't hush, I'll pick you up and spit in your ass. <laughs> the coarsest thing I ever said to anyone. His eyes widened at the prospect of my boast. <laughs> and a boast it was, a saying I'd merely heard, so not original to me. But I liked it because it conjured an image I had to struggle to see. And then when I saw it clearly, it made me laugh. 
And I sought occasions to say the saying when I was younger, like a riddle or a dirty rhyme. I liked to hear it. I thought of it as a jocular interruption of the air because too much solemnity is duller than a butter knife. Humble people like to laugh, but those incapable of laughter struck me as being already dead or not sufficiently alive. And that was the purpose of my life, to make others feel more alive either by wisdom or vulgar phrases or nonsense, whose sudden utterance is like the bell of beauty ringing.